Praise the Lord, everybody. How many of y'all is glad to be in the house of the Lord tonight? Pouring down rain on the outside, but it can pour down rain on the inside. Amen. I'm glad to be here. Brother Brenton, he sent a message here to us. I believe it was Sunday. We was meeting for the first time because of the weather and all that stuff. We wasn't able to be here Wednesday night. We wasn't able to be here for a recovery Thursday night. And he said, man, I need some river bend in my life. I feel like that tonight. I'm glad to be in the house of the Lord tonight. Amen. Glad to be here to see all of your smiling faces. I know the weather's bad, raining, but the Lord is here. Amen. Let's just give him a hand clap of praise and thank him for the opportunity to be in the house of the Lord tonight. Hallelujah. We thank you, Lord Jesus. We magnify you, Lord, because you are worthy of our praise. Amen. If you have any prayer requests tonight, we're going to get right to it. Just let them be made known by the raising of your hand. I know Sister Callie asked that we will remember Megan. Y'all's been seeing the messages that we had to pray for her. So let's go before the Lord tonight for all of these requests and for little Megan as well. Dear Lord, we magnify you. We praise you. We know, God, that you're the God that heals us, the God that protects us, the God that goes before us, Lord. You see potential in us, God, when we can't see it in ourselves. God, when we don't know which way to go, what direction to take, Lord, you're the one that keeps us, the one that protects us. As long as we obey your word and seek your face, oh God, you're going to lead us and guide us in the way that we should go. And I pray tonight, God, that you begin to move upon each and every need that was mentioned in this place. Whatever the need, whatever the situation may be, God, we give it to you and we ask, Lord, and faith believing that you touch and move in each and every one of these situations. God, move in Megan's life, oh God. I know that the doctors may seem it's dim and they don't know what to do, God. There's situations that seem like it might be the end, Lord, but we know beyond a shadow of a doubt that you are the God that heals us. God, you created our bodies and you know us, oh Lord, and we're putting it in your hands tonight and asking and faith believing that you begin to move in this situation. God, there's a lot of prayers been going up, and we know, God, that as your word says that the prayers are a memorial before you, and we're asking that you touch and move, Lord. We give you honor tonight, we give you praise, and we give you glory, because you are the only one that deserves it. In the mighty, powerful, and wonderful name of Jesus Christ, we ask it. Amen and amen.
seated in the house tonight I couldn't help but think I woke up this morning and I, Brother David I was thinking of Gideon in the Bible I actually shared it with the men and I'm going to read it to you tonight just for a second but Gideon we know the son of Joash he was threshing wheat and he was hiding it by a wine press Brother Blake he was storing it an angel of the Lord appeared unto him and called him a mighty man of valor he said, you're a mighty hero, Gideon. You're something powerful. Now, in our eyes, Brother Terrence, Gideon don't look like much. He's threshing wheat and he's hiding it. What kind of hero does that look like? But the Lord saw something in him that he didn't even see in himself. And I believe there's some people under the sound of my voice here tonight that the Lord sees things in us that we don't see in ourselves. We don't understand how the Lord can use somebody like us. And if we're not careful, we'll limit ourselves because of our own self-doubt instead of putting our faith and trust with the Johnny and the one that's able to do it. Amen. It's not my ability, but it's his ability. I can do nothing without him. I can't breathe. I can't walk. I can't even talk without the Lord. But as long as I'm obedient to him, as long as I seek him, as long as I call upon him, as long as I follow him, he will lead me and guide me in the way that he wants me to go. Amen. And I will be exactly what he wants me to be. I want to read this just for a second. Gideon said, he replied, after the angel told him, you mighty hero, he said, if the Lord is with us, Brother Terrence, why is all this stuff happening to us? Where's all the miracles that our ancestors told us about? Didn't they say the Lord brought us up out of Egypt, but now the Lord has abandoned us? And handed us over to the Midianites. And the Lord turned to him and said, Go with strength. Go with the strength you have and rescue Israel from the Midianites. I am sending you. What a powerful truth to know. That I could be hiding in a wine press. Just trying to store up some grain that the enemy can't steal. Because he's coming to take everything that we got. And I might be trying to just hide my little bit, but the Lord is standing here tonight saying, Brother David, you go and fight the enemy because I've called you to do a work. There's souls out there, church, that's looking for an answer to the things that they're facing. And you know what? We've got the answer, and it is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. He's calling us tonight to do the work that he set before us. Amen. I want to be what he wants me to be. I want to be the, the man that he's called me to be, and i got to do it when I realize that I'm able to do it through him, Brother Terrence, not my own ability. But God is calling us tonight to do something, and I'm thankful for that. Sister Scarlett, if you don't mind, let's give them the ways to give tonight. We have GiveLify and PayPal available at RiverbendPentecostals.com. You can send your cash and checks to be mailed to Riverbend Pentecostals, P.O. Box 477, New Madrid, Missouri, 63869. We also have text to give, which is 833-883-9311. If you've got your tithes tonight, you can put them in the ones closest to the pulpit. Your offering is to go to the ones on the outside. And if you can, let's all stand in the house tonight. We're going to say this prayer with faith. Upon the authority of your word I have given, and it shall be given unto me. Pressed down, shaken together, and running over. I'm a tither, and I give my offerings, and I bring them today into your storehouse. Therefore, the enemy is rebuked, and the curse is broken, and I live under an open heaven. You pour out upon me such a blessing that there is not enough room to receive it. We receive jobs and better jobs, raises and bonuses, sales and commissions, benefits and settlements, estates and inheritances, interest and incomes, rebates and returns, checks in the mail, gifts and surprises, bills paid off. 
debts demolished and royalties received. My whole family saved and serving God in perfect health and abundance, walking in divine favor and blessings. I'm blessed going in and I'm blessed going out. And all that I do will prosper in Jesus' name. And the church said, Amen. Amen. God bless you. Come and give with what the Lord has blessed you with tonight. There's a spiritual warfare going on on the battlefield of my mind. Pulling down strongholds and high mountains to climb. There's dark valleys to walk through, but Satan, don't forget. I'm bought by the blood of Jesus, so don't start your party yet. Satan, don't start your party, don't start your party. Just because you wounded me don't mean that you have one. For I had the armor of God on the body just because. I see you trembling now since I spoke his name. I have a new grip on my sword and I'm gathering new strength. A shield of faith in front of me and my helmet's all right. Do you recall those famous words I just Start your party, don't start your dancing yet. Laugh for you want to, but don't do your instruments. Oh, just because you wounded me, don't mean that you have one. Or oh, have the armor of God on the body, just because. I see you trembling now, since I spoke his name. Amen. We ought to put that armor on every day. Brother Richard, you may be seated. Brother Richard sent us something here a few weeks back. And he said he woke up and he was in a, just a, a funk, I guess you could say, in a bad place. And he said he began to ask the Lord, what do I need to do, do Lord? And he said he believed that the Lord impressed on him to pray on the armor of God. And he began to do that. And he sent it to us. In our little ministry group, and he was like, man, I prayed on the armor of God today. He said, I think everybody needs to do that. He said, because it done something to me. And that really bit me up to realize that, you know what? It's not just a, a scripture that we read. It's something that we do, Brother Josh. It's something that we physically got to realize that God has called us to do is put the word in us that we won't fail him. David said, thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. That's the whole point. That I can hide something in me. That I can be exactly what God wants me to be. Amen. If you're glad to be in the house of the Lord tonight. One more time. Let's just give him a hand clap of praise. And thank him for the opportunity. Amen. Hallelujah. If I can have all of the Riverbend kids to line up around the front. We're going to pray for them this morning. Or this evening rather. Riverbend ignited. You'll be staying out here with us tonight. Y'all won't be going to the back, but these youngins, these little babies, they're going to the back. I know they don't want to be called babies no more because they're getting big. But I tell you what, this is a good class, a good class to teach. And I'm going to tell you right now, Brother Billy, they memorize a lot more and remember a lot more than what you give them credit for. Because they, I told them a story one night about me when I was a little boy being hung up in a sleeping bag. And out of all the Bible stories I got, they remember me getting hung up in a sleeping bag. And they ain't forgot that. So I'm thankful that they know exactly what we're talking about when we're trying to teach them. But if you all will, just lift your hands up to these children tonight. And we're going to pray for them that the Lord would keep them, strengthen them. Not only them, but the teachers in the back as well. Dear Lord, we love you. We thank you for the opportunity, God, to pray for these babies tonight. 
We thank you for another chance to be in your house, to magnify you and to praise you. But we pray right now, God, that your anointing hand and power will be upon each and every one of these children. God, not only in this place tonight, but go with them. Protect them and keep them, Lord. We read in your word where angels encamp round about those that love you. God, I pray that you keep angels in camp round about them and their families, Lord. That you protect them, help them to remember your word and hide it in their heart that they can remember in their low times, God. That you're always with them. That you said you'd never forsake them and you would be with them always, even until the end of the world. I pray for your blessings upon them, their homes and their families. That you would strengthen them, encourage them and bless them and use them for your kingdom, even right now, Lord. Bless the teachers as they begin to teach them tonight, God, and let them hide thy word in their hearts, O oh God, that they can walk before you all of their days. In the name of Jesus, we ask it. Amen and amen. Okay, Braxton, lead them on back, buddy. All right. How many of y'all love these youngins? It's a good group of kids. Amen. Oh, there you go. I know River Bend ignited may be disappointed that they don't get to go back and I'm glad you are I'm glad you're disappointed I'm glad you would have a great group of students on Wednesday nights but you're here at my request tonight I have I, I have asked that you be kept out here tonight because I feel some direction from heaven with urgency and so we're going to continue in practical holiness Actually, this is Practical Holiness Part 1 because we're going to get down into the nuts and bolts of what holy looks like. But if you're not holy on the inside, the outside means nothing. That's right. That's right. That's right. Nothing. Please understand, the outside does not make you holy. doesn't because if that if that were true then we really are just like a cult if you wear the right uniform you fit in okay that doesn't make you holy it's a reflection of his holiness which is even more powerful right y'all gotta stay with me now y'all know I'm I uh I uh, appreciate you, Brother Christian. Brother Blake, he's, he's lost over there. She's been gone a few <laughs> She's been gone a few days, and he's all moon-eyed and stuff. So y'all pray, y'all pray his strength in the Lord. I don't know if everybody noticed, but Christian beat Blake to the punch. That means you're in second place. <laughs> You know what I mean by that, don't you? Uh-huh. Yeah. <laughs> Brother Blake don't like to lose. So I, I just let him know it happened in the house of God. So it must be the will of God. Let me tell you something. Sunday morning, you better watch out, Christian, because he's going to be picking them up and putting them down. Yeah. I, uh, I, uh. I'm, I'm a, I, I don't feel like really, I, uh, I think these last five lessons leading into this are um, an approach to holiness that is unique but deep and powerful. And uh, um, we're learning... Um, before I begin, if you want to be holy, you will be. If you want to be worldly, you will be. And I'm going to say this. I have it later in my notes, but I feel it in the beginning. If you and I will submit ourselves to the Holy Ghost, to the Word of God, the man of God, and the Spirit of God, this is where we're going to end up at, regardless of what we teach. Because it's the book. It's creative order. And that's why he came to give us the Holy Ghost, 
is to bring us back to creative order. If you're buying what the world is selling, you're going to be lost. I'm, I'm not judging you. I'm just telling you. The world ain't right. They're not right. Their ideas of gender are so wrong, they've gone crazy. All right? Jerry Clower had it figured out a long time ago. Anybody remember that story about gender equality and Jerry Clower? He said, he, he said, Mama don't want nobody messing up the deal she's got. Y'all remember that? Huh? We're, gonna, we're going to understand what God wants. And I promise you, in creative order, men and women will never be happier than when they're in God's creative order. The focus of this is to teach biblical principles of holiness unto the Lord because that's what it is. It's holy unto the Lord. And to share practical ways to apply these principles to our lives and then live accordingly. That's where we're at. Does that make sense? Okay. These principles and behaviors, I'm just going to review and I'm going to review in overdrive. All right? It's not on your handout, but you've been sitting in this class for the last several weeks. I'm going to say this. I'm going to say this to the TV crowd. I'm also going to say this to, we got a bunch of people played hooky tonight. I, and I say that tongue in cheek. We have some folks sick. We have some not feeling good. We have some had other obligations, but the list is very long. Missing church does not absolve you of the responsibility to grab a hold of what we're teaching, especially since you go and watch it tomorrow. Because there's been people try that before. They knew what I was teaching and they stayed home. They kept on living what they were living and said, I wasn't there to hear that. Sorry. That dog don't hunt in the TV world. Now that I'm giving old smiling Joel a run for his money. Okay. These principles and behaviors are not restrictive. The world is going to tell you they are. They're not restrictive. But they demonstrate God's original plan for our lives, which we will refer to very often as created order or creative order. And in creative order, you will find true freedom and you will live in dominion. Do you understand what it means to live in dominion? Huh? That means that you do not live you do not live dancing to the world, the devil, or anybody else's tune. You live in authority and you live in dominion as the Lord intended for man to live all along. Okay? Now, we are to receive this teaching as parents to children. There are three characteristics that identify the parent-child relationship. The first is you love one another. And it runs both ways. Parents, you have a responsibility under God to teach your children the right way to live. Okay. Trust. That's the second thing. The parent-child relationship is trust that runs both ways. And the third, the identifying characteristic is obedience. And parents realize that when they hold their children accountable, they are actually being obedient to God by doing so. And we've learned that a whole lot of the time we got on to our children because they made us mad, they embarrassed us, they caught us at the wrong time. We rarely disciplined our children the way God intended for us to. Discipline was given to us as an admonition by God in order to bring our children to a place where they'll be successful in life, not leave us alone. That's right. That's right. Now, please, all y'all don't look at me like you're crazy because I've seen some of you spank your kids because they embarrassed you real bad at church. And you were not thinking, boy, I'm going to tear their tail up, but they're going to love the Lord next year. 
You were thinking, if they ever do that to me again, in front of them people again, it ain't going to be a spanking they get, but I'm going to wring their ever-loving neck. That's the truth, Brother Christian. You don't know nothing about that, but just keep smiling because your day is coming. <laughs> the next thing is we have to understand the responsibility we have to our past. Talking about our past heritage, the apostles, the prophets, and our future as well, and how we prepare ourselves to fulfill it. Hebrews 11, 39 and 40, and then Hebrews 12 and 1. Seeing we are also compassed about by so great a cloud of witnesses. You remember that? Yeah. Let us lay aside every weight and the sin that does so easily beset us. As you grow in the Lord, there's going to be some junk you're going to have to get rid of. All right, that's the book. Okay? And everything you have to get rid of is not necessarily sin. Weights are things that tangle you up, slow you down, stop you. Okay, the way we do this, according to Hebrews 12 and 2, is we look to Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. We understand that the world is under control of the Logos, John chapter 1, verses 1 and 2, and then, of course, 14. We understand that, that the, the identifying characteristic of the Logos is it keeps everything where it's supposed to. And everything still operates as it's supposed to, except for those that are affected, except for mankind and that which is affected by mankind. Okay? So Jesus Christ came in flesh so that he might bring us back to creative order and get us back where we're supposed to belong. All right? Because the creative order was living in authority, a delightful place in the presence of the Lord. But when Adam and Eve sinned, excuse the, 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 the rude, the crude, or bold reference, but all hell literally broke loose in the world. Chaos came. People started killing one another. Right out the gate. Jealous, envy, strife. Okay, you kids, just hang with me because I'm going to get where I want you to be in just a minute. We learned that we've got to start striving against sin rather than against sinners. And they're not the same thing. You don't destroy sin by attacking a sinner. That's right. That's right. Yeah, that's right. Hebrews 12 and 4. And we learned the Jesus strategy to striving against sin is keep living your life the way God ordered you to live your life. Because that's what Jesus did, Right? Okay, creative order. We're going back there. Can I get an amen? amen? We learned that chastening comes from the Greek word paideia, and it means instruction that trains someone to reach full maturity. That's how the Lord chastens you. That's why the Lord chastens you, is to give you some instruction so you can be perfect, because that's what the Bible means when it means be perfect, be fully mature, complete. Okay, um, we learned that the Bible says despise not the chastening of the Lord. And it talks about enduring chastening. When you despise the chastening of the Lord, you feel like he's mean to you and you quit. When you endure the chastening of the Lord, you understand he loves you and that everything he's bringing on you is so he can bring you to where he wants you to be in your life. All right, now. We learned that his chastening is for our profit that we might become partakers of his holiness. Right. Hebrews 12 and 10. We learned in 1 Thessalonians 5 and 23 that the very God of peace or the very God of order sanctify you. Remember that? Holy. And I pray your whole spirit soul and body be preserved blameless under the coming of the Lord. So the teaching of the word is designed to bring you, make you holy spirit, soul, and body. All right? Spirit's the part of us that knows God. It's the part of us that's connected to God. It's the part that sin destroyed. The soul is the part governed by our feelings, by our senses. It's our flesh. That's the soul part. And the body part is all this. Where the soul and the spirit live. What happens when you're filled with the baptism of the Holy Ghost is the spirit is resurrected. 
That's why it's the death, the burial, and the resurrection. The death is the old man dies. The burial is he's buried. And the resurrection is he's born again. Okay? To walk in newness of life. It's a different life. All right. And it affects your spirit, your soul, and your body. Why is it the body so important? Because it's the billboard. It's heaven's billboard in this world. You cannot just walk around or sitting in the lotus position and everybody say, oh, my goodness, he's so holy. <laughs> no, nobody knows what's going on inside him. Man doesn't look at the heart. But he show, what shows up on the outside reveals what's in the heart. Okay. All right. Practical holiness. Holiness is absolute conformity. This is all review. I'm still reviewing. Absolute conformity to the character and the will of God. The Lord God Almighty is not going to get frustrated with mankind and start grading on the curve. Do y'all know what the curve is? Y'all anybody know what the curve is? Somebody tell me what the curve is. You know you hated that smart kid in class. You take the high standard in the class and you call that 100%. God don't roll like that. The standard is always the word of God and Jesus Christ. He is the end of the law to everyone that believeth. Everything the law was trying to do in the life of a human being showed up in the life of Jesus. All right. There are two components of holiness. Number one is separation from sin and the values of the world. Number two, dedication to God and his will. So we have got to be separated unto God, but we got to realize there's a purpose for it, and it is not to join the Pentecostal club. It is to live, practice, and receive the divine order, the divine direction, so you can be launched into the ministry that God had for you all along. That's what it's for. Right. So we're not, and I feel a little Holy Ghost rising up on a Wednesday night. You just have to excuse me. It's furthest thing from shackling you down and holding you back. Right. It's to loose you into your anointing and into your purpose and in your power. Holiness is not restrictive, but it's freeing. Yes. Be ye holy is a commandment of God, 1 Peter chapter 1, 15 and 16. It truly means, according to Brother Bernard's book, and I like it, so I'm preaching it. It means thinking like God thinks, loving as God loves, hating what God hates, and acting like God does. That's our job. How do we know how God acts? We look in the life of Jesus Christ, because that's who he was. All right. Holiness I ain't never reviewed this fast before. I may need to get some oxygen in a minute. Holiness begins where? With a changed mind. That's what true repentance is. It's saying, Lord, I don't know everything you have for me, but I want it. I don't know wherever you want me to go, but I want to go there. And all of that out in the world don't want it no more. It ain't worked for me. It ain't helped me. It's hurt me. It's tried to kill me. It tried to destroy me. I want everything God has for me. So it's way more than just saying, Lord, please forgive me of my sins. All right. It, that's part of it. You have to confess with your mouth. That's how you get forgiveness. Okay? Holiness. Oh, Jesus, help us. I don't want to get hung up on this, so I put all these scriptures in here. Holiness. Y'all stay with me now. Take your, put your phone on, put your game on pause right now. 
holiness, I want to get down here because I want y'all to hear me. Whatever you do, tell Dustin I did great tonight. I, I don't care. Just tell him. Holiness is first and most powerfully manifested in a holy mouth. Your mouth makes or breaks your testimony. And the book says it in, let's see, Matthew 15, 11, Matthew 12, 34, Ephesians 4, 29, James 1 and 26, and the whole entire cock-picking chapter of James 3. James 1, 26, as a matter of fact, says, if you claim to be religious and can't control your mouth, you're a liar. It really says your religion's vain and empty. You ain't jack squat if you can't control your mouth in the kingdom of God. I feel like, I really feel like somebody ought to say bless him, Lord, or something because I'm struggling so bad. Because we, we, for some reason, people that think that if they got all this right, they get a pass on doo-doo coming out of their mouth. You don't. Ladies and gentlemen, we have got to purpose in our heart to have talked bad about our last person. Ever to have run our last person down, to have shared our last word of gossip ever. You notice I said we. We have got to start purposing based upon what I just said. Holiness is first and foremost manifest in having a holy mouth. And the things that we go around here and do all willy nilly out of habit. The Bible said the Lord hates them and they're an abomination unto him. Okay. Now, you young people, thank you for joining us. Because now I'm coming to you. Tonight we begin. I did not intend to do this and the Holy Ghost corrected me about as fast as I've ever been corrected. I even had another thing wrote down at the headline of my Bible study because I wanted to get into the things some of y'all really are wanting me to get into so bad you can't stand it. Tonight we're going to talk about Christian entertainment. Let's talk about the eye. Matthew chapter 6, verses 22 through 23 in the New Living Translation. Are we together yet, Sister Scarl? That's what I'm talking about. She's on time, tight, everything's going right. I don't know where she got that from, but she does it. I finally got, I was trying to get an amen out of Sister Ashley, but she just laughed. But, but that's all right, I'll take whatever I can get. <laughs> Your eye is like a lamp. That provides light for your body. But I want you to understand it's not talking about shining out this way. It's talking about your eye shines inward. It's the source of light for your body. Okay? When your eye is healthy, your whole body is filled with light. I'm, I'm going I'm to break it down for you. Don't worry. But when your eye is unhealthy, your whole body is filled with darkness. And if the light you think you have is actually darkness, how deep that darkness is. Here's why this is so important. I come tonight to ring a bell, sound a trumpet, turn the alarm on, we got to start being better evaluators of what we're letting in our mind. Pulpit commentary says this. As the body is illuminated by the eye, it is, or for example, 
as by the eye, the bodily constitution learns its environment. So you begin to look around. And as you see things, it naturally, almost automatically, tends to accommodate itself to it. You begin to fashion yourself based upon what you see. I know it's true, Sister Crystal, because how many of you have ever seen your little toddler? Daddy's standing at the sink shaving. Little dude watches for a while, and he comes over and stands. Starts taking his screwdriver or taking his toy pistol, whatever he's got in his hand at that moment, and starts shaving with it. Okay? How many of you have ever, ooh, baby, I can preach a little. How many of you have ever watched a new convert show up at church and they don't know the rules? What do they do? Whatever they see everybody else doing. Okay? Look here. That's a picture of the light is the, is the lightness. It's, it's that, oh, that light bulb going off in here. Look at here. So when what we see, we naturally begin to accommodate ourselves to it. If this be upon the things of this world, the soul perceives and tends to accommodate itself to the things of this world. But if upon things in heaven, it perceives and tends to accommodate itself to the things of heaven. So I will ask you right now, is it the world, the dominant influence in your life, or is it the Lord? That's a question we have to answer. If we don't know the answer to it, we need to figure it out. Oh, buddy. I said this Sunday, I heard, I heard Brother Dame's words say it over there, so this is his fault. Sometimes when it gets right, it gets tight. It is right now. That Siri said, I didn't get that. Can you try again? <laughs> I think that was the Holy Ghost saying, I need to say it again. <laughs> Here's the summary of what I just read to you in the pulpit commentary. You cannot constantly inundate and surround yourself with the world and be like Jesus. And you know why some of us are having, God, I feel the Holy Ghost, man. You know why some of us are having such a hard time living for God? Is we're inundating ourselves with the world but we want to act like Jesus and it ain't working for us. And we're frustrated and we're aggravated. I'm going to delve off into that, but I just had to jump ahead. Now look at here. Look at here. The things you allow to enter your mind by the way of your eye can never be unseen. Neither can the effects of what you see be ignored? What you allow into your life through the portal of your eyeball will affect you and you can't stop it. You young people listen to the preacher, pastor, G Money, whatever you want to call me. I know y'all call me GL when y'all texting one another. Y'all better cut that out. I'm Brother GL. That ain't no joke. Or I'm pastor. You ain't earned the right to call me GL. That's right. Besides, y'all shouldn't be calling no grown folks by their first name. You can never take back what you take a picture of and throw out there on the internet. You're going to be a mama someday. You're going to be a daddy someday. You're going to be a grandma and a grandpa at the Lord Terry's. And that junk that gets put on the internet is still going to be floating around out there somewhere. If somebody, if somebody's sending you pictures of nasty stuff, block them right now. I don't care who it is. Do you know, this is the Holy Ghost right now. Do you know if you have a picture of one of your pal's body parts on your phone and you get caught, you will go to jail? Yep. Yep, that's right. Mm -hmm. right. We ain't supposed to preach that stuff in church, are we? Hmm? 
That's the Holy Ghost. If you don't, if you don't like it, call me. I'll, I'll talk to you about it. The Holy Ghost said, you talk, bring them kids out there and tell them it ain't a game. It's serious, and it'll carry eternal ramifications. I don't care what the world tells you. It ain't cool. It ain't funny. Stop it. I feel some comeback, and I don't like it, and I don't know why. I don't know why, but it's the Holy Ghost. Look at here. Jesus taught, Brother David Bernard said, Jesus taught that the eye is the gate to the heart or soul. It is the principal sensory organ that we use to receive information from the outside world. If our eye is constantly filled with evil sights, then our thoughts and actions will be drastically affected. Get this. I think this is powerful. Psychologists have verified this statement estimating that 90% of our thought life is stimulated by what we see. You understand what I mean by that? 90%, 90% of what you think about came into your life through your eyeballs. I read this. He has this in their statistic too. 65% of, uh, of, let me say it, we only, statistically speaking, we only retain 15% of what we hear. But we retain 65% of what we see in here. That's why David said in Psalms 101, the end of verse 2 and the beginning of verse 3, he said, I will walk within my house with a perfect heart. What's your house? I will walk in this body with a perfect heart. But look what he said, and here's how I'm going to ensure it happens. Verse 3, I will set no wicked thing before mine eyes. The first guard that we have to do to be holy is make sure we regulate what comes through here according to the word of God. If we want to be holy, we have to regulate what we set before our eyes. There are three areas in which we can sin. Y'all know what they are? 1 John chapter number 1, verse, or chapter number 2, verse number 16. They are the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eye, and the pride of life. Now the flesh is comprised primarily of the five senses. That's the lust of the flesh. But you notice the eye has a category all to itself. Eve first saw the fruit. Achan first saw the garment and the silver and the gold. David first, boy, I preach about this. David first saw Bathsheba taking a bath. Everybody with a, one eye and half a brain knows that if you come up on a woman naked taking a bath and she ain't your wife, you turn your head and walk away. That's the first warning that he, that he ignored is just common sense. Then sin followed. But I want you to think about this. The devil took Jesus to a high place. And what does it say, Brother David? Showed him all the world and said, if you worship me, I'll give it all to you. Now, it did not work. But what did it give us insight into? I that it does. You're exactly right. And that's a powerful point. It gave us the way to, to, uh, to overcome that temptation. But more than anything, what did the devil do right there? Showed him what? No, what did he show us? He tipped his hand. He showed us his strategy. 
He showed us his tactics of what he's going to do. It shows us that the strategy of hell is universal. That he believes he can get into your mind and your life through your eyeballs. And let me tell you, he can. Because if I begin to talk right now and begin to bring things back to your memory, oh, never mind, just file that away because I was jumping ahead of myself. Brother Bernard offers these four reasons for which the enemy uses the eye as a portal to invade our lives. First, the eye is the way we encounter things that we have previously neither known or considered. The eye is the way he, the primary way he introduces the forbidden to us, especially the attractive forbidden. Come on now. I don't want to be too terrible. I've probably already been too plain with our students in here. But what in the world do you think is going on when the devil uses a woman in a bikini to sell car insurance? I saw it. I saw a billboard in St. Louis, Missouri. It had a woman with hardly no clothes on sitting on the hood of a car, and the ad was for car insurance. Why? The devil knows that stuff works. Okay? So that's the way we encounter things that we have previously neither known or considered. Then, and here's where I was going just a second ago. When you see something you shouldn't see, it is embedded in your memory for the devil to revive as a quick temptation when we're weak or discouraged. Because, Sister Crystal, you can't unsee it. Third, constant exposure to certain sights and the ideas that come with them causes us to become accustomed or, in effect, desensitized to them. Then they become acceptable or normal to us. Finally, if we harbor thoughts about these things and focus on them, we will sin. Either in wayward, out of control thinking. Remember what Jesus said about adultery? Huh? Under grace, adultery is ogling a woman with lust in your heart. Because that mind can do things. We're going to talk about that when we get over into modesty. Why super skin tight stuff and suggestive stuff is often worse than minimal stuff. Because it hints at something and then lets your mind make the rest of the story up for you. Knock him out, John. <laughs> we will sin if we allow these things to stay in our lives. I'm going to say this right now. I am persuaded that what I'm teaching tonight would cause the divorce rate to decrease if we would get this in our spirit, our mind, and believe it. Because I'm telling you right now, people get married because of a fantasy, and they get divorced because of a bigger fantasy, and they keep chasing that fantasy. Let me tell you something, fellas. That gal in the checkout line don't look like that in real life. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. But it's the world. The world has manipulated our thinking. Let me tell you something. Just because she's got curves in the right places doesn't make her a good wife for you. 
And just because that he, he's got this just right or this job just right or he's got this perfect tan or whatever, don't make him right for you either. But the world will make you think that's what you need to be happy. I heard about somebody got a divorce. They, they got married the same month that Garrison and Paige got married and they've already got a divorce. Because she says we're two different people. You don't even know one another yet in a year. How do you know you're two different people? But there's, a, there's a, an assault. Ah, there's an assault on our minds and on our hearts that's all lies. It's not true and it's not real, so stop believing it. Oh, Lord have mercy. I'm so nervous right now. There's some areas. There are going to be things that we're going to be exposed to on the everyday streets of life that we cannot control. It's the world we live in. But there are many things that we allow into our lives that we have complete control over. Remember the portion of the Lord's Prayer pattern? Does anybody remember me teaching the Lord's Prayer pattern? I still pray it sometimes. And there's a portion that says, lead me not into temptation. Do y'all remember what that means? What is my temptation? Lead me, there we go. Lead me not into temptation is me praying, Lord, remind me when I'm about to go places I ain't got no business going. You understand, I'm not just talking about physically going places. In my mind or in my thoughts or in my conversation, Lord, you know, you and I both know where I get tripped up at. Help me stay away from there today. Because if I get in the wrong place, in the wrong circumstances, around the wrong people, me and you both know I'm going to get messed up. So I'm giving you free reign. Lead me not into temptation, but... Deliver me from evil, which is things that come at me that I don't have no control over. All right, there's things coming at me that I don't have no control over. Opportunities presented to me that I didn't go looking for. I don't really know what this means, but I read it. Like somebody sliding into my DMs that ain't got no business being there. They know what I'm talking about. I just know it ain't a good thing when you slide into it. There's some folks got nervous up in here right then. Listen, listen, this happened to me yesterday. Yesterday. All right? Somebody, I ain't telling you who, but they ain't here. Somebody sat on their phone and called me and left me a 54-second voicemail that I listened. I want you to hear me, Brother David. My flesh said, you're about to catch them doing something they don't want to be caught doing. And I listened to about five seconds. Melanie and the Holy Ghost said, delete it. There's some people right now thinking, are you crazy? You was about to find out some serious junk on somebody. You know what the Holy Ghost knew? You don't need to know that junk. I would submit to you that as we begin to mature in the Lord, we're going to try to find ways to avoid hearing that nonsense rather than getting off into it and finding it out. Because I did push the little triangle that makes it play. And I got about five seconds into it, and I realized right then, they didn't do that on purpose. That wasn't none of my business. Oh, you could have called them. No, no, no. How in the world I got off of that on entertainment, I don't know, except for the fact that for some reason we find that junk entertaining. Yes, ma'am. Oh, it is. It is. But we talked about that. We talked about that just a while ago, you know, 
the place it starts is what you see. Because you can hear a sweet little thing's voice and shut it off. But you can't shut it off when you see it. It is. It's a choice. We're talking about setting boundaries. We're starting to talk about some things I just can't do. Even Ahab. There's a place when they came to Ahab and they said, you need to do this. He said, okay, you need to do this. He said, okay. And they said, you need to do this. And he said, uh-uh. Right. This thing I will not do. There's going to have to be, hear me right now. There's going to have to be some things come up in your life that the Holy Ghost can say no and you say, yes, sir. Amen. But above that. Everybody needs somebody in their life that has veto power. That when you start going somewhere and they say no, that you listen to them without question. Brother Larry. I think it's chapter 7. Yeah, here, let me give you this microphone because Brenton, Brenton played hooky tonight. Not, not really. His grandmother's in the hospital bad sick. Yes, I just said is. that. I, uh, when, you, when you begin to talk about what you see, I was reminded of what I read last night about, uh, like you said, I believe it is Proverbs chapter 7, but it's talking about the more, um, immoral woman and it lists all the things about her. But then it says don't even go near her door. Yes. So your eyes can't see if there's a boundary prior to getting to that place. That's right. So if you if you set boundaries godly prior to even allow yourself to get that place, right. you can't be tempted right. by that sin. Right. And that's why the boundaries have got to not be right on the border. Because right. yeah. on the border, you see things you ain't got no business seeing. The boundaries got to be set to protect you. Not justifyingly allow you to sin. Okay. Thank you all for them comments. Absolutely. Okay. Visual media, printed and electronic. I'm back to something that affects the young people now. Matthew 15, 18 through 20. But those things which proceed out of the mouth come forth from the heart and they defile the man. Y'all understand that's the Bible. Okay. For out of the heart proceeds evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, fornications, thefts, false witness, blasphemies. These are the things which defile a man. Where in the world do those things come from? How did they get in you in order to come out of you? It's what you, it's what you are allowing to influence you or what you're choosing as entertainment has become the enemy's portal into your mind. What is put in is what comes out. The Bible says... For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. Romans chapter 1 declares the destiny of a people characterized by worshiping and serving the creature, which is that which is created rather than the creator. With the strong inference being that the flesh becomes the object of our worship rather than the spirit. In Romans chapter 1, 23 sins are clearly delineated between about verse 16 and verse 32, somewhere thereabouts. Abominable, ungodly sins, which on a carnal level carry the connotation of freedom to do as I please. But what they are is evidence of a people that God abandoned 
to do whatever their shameful hearts desire. Romans 1 28. I'm going to get you this. Don't let me forget. Romans 1 and 28 in the New Living Translation. Since they thought it foolish to acknowledge God, he abandoned them to their foolish thinking and let them do things that should never be done. This is the answer to the question many of us ask, how in the world do they do that? Because they persisted in pursuit of worshiping the creature more than the creator, the regulating influence of God Almighty backed away to allow them to do what they wanted to do. And there is no end to the depravity of a human being. Because God made us in such a way that we get dopamine rush when we do these things. But when you do them and do them, you stop getting a rush, so you got. Man. And there is no limit to the depravity of a human being. So, all right, Des, I'm going to let you go because I'm fixing to break some scripture down here. Okay, I'm, I'm just sitting here thinking, like, how sad and how unfortunate it is that some people, okay, at a young age, being a product of your environment and not everybody's environment is as of what we're talking about. You know, all these negative things is normal. And um, I'm, I refuse to sit here and feel bad for myself and think of the horrible places and the things that I've seen that has became normal mm -hmm. because now I know the difference and I'm thankful for having people that care enough to share the blessings and testimonies and share the right way to live and the right way yes. for the past to, to, yes. to, you know, be right. And it's, uh -huh. it's not that hard. Like I find that if you really wanted it, it's like, it just comes naturally. Like, and I, I, like I was saying, I feel blessed to have known both sides of that spectrum. Like uh -huh. I remember when it was okay for these horrible things to be going on and I just had to just live with it and it was okay at the time but now I know it's not okay you know and I look at my brother and my child and know that they can be shielded from ever having to experience yes. that or have to learn how it is to to set boundaries and to never slip into sin because I lived there for so long mm -hmm. and now I'm blessed with the capability to like recognize and just after a while, it takes practice, and I'm getting better at it, but, like, I'm able to just, I don't watch music videos, and I don't, just because, and it just happens, and it feels good, and, like, my nightmares are going away, and, and it's true, like, I remember my parents, when I was at a young age, watching The Exorcism, and I was so fascinated, they didn't want me to watch it, but being curious, and, and just being tiptoeing on that line I remember it and you can't unsee those things because to this day I still remember hiding in the hallways trying to get a peek of it and that's being a product of my environment and I chose to try to tiptoe into that and see it and now being older not only do I make my own decisions for my life and what I want to wear and dress but like my decisions and what I want to remember what I want to hear and think about like it is so good like it's so different and it's not hard and it's amazing and it just becomes natural and then and you don't feel I'm bad i'm gonna have to i'm gonna have to stop you you're yeah. gonna be preaching the whole sermon <laughs> it's like you don't feel bad at the end of the day you're not being upset because you did something or you laughed at something or you sat there and watched something and then shared something that you know makes you cringe like for what, what? in the world I, I could not say it any better you know, I mean that 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 was that was this. Yeah. It's peace, order, safety. Yeah. It's you heard her say. Oh my goodness! You heard her say. My nightmares are going away, and I'm not there yet, but I'm practicing. Yeah, right. Oh my goodness! Yeah, right. Hallelujah! That's it. That's it. 
And it's so incredible that I'm teaching this and I'm teaching pretty straight and pretty, pretty, pretty straight. But Des is hearing it like God wants it heard. Because the book says, Blessed are they that do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. There's not a devil in hell that can stop you from being filled up with the righteousness of God if you continue to be hungry for it. I know Des is not perfect, but what you just said is a mouthful, young lady. God abandoned them. So let's, do we got one in 28? Since they thought it foolish to acknowledge God, Let's talk about that. What does that mean to you? When did they think it foolish to acknowledge God? When they didn't want to do what he said. When they didn't want to do what he said. Yeah. Boom. When they something is presented and you know that God don't like it. Like I heard this today. I read this today. And I want you to know that Grammy nonsense from yesterday ain't got nothing to do with this. I had this rolling before I ever even knew about that. Okay? But one of our mainstream, world-famous, multi-platinum performers said, I'm a Christian, but not the Christianity of the outdated Bible. I read that today. She made that statement yesterday or today. Okay. Just keep that in your mind just for a minute. They thought it foolish to acknowledge God. Well, here's, here's what's happening. Here's what's happening. We are a Judeo-Christian culture. This country, slice it, dice it, call it what you want. We came up on the Bible. Research it. Go back in history. All of them were not Christians. All of the founding fathers were not Christians. But they did believe in the power of the Bible. And the truth of the biblical principles. All right? So we, we as a society in general, like for instance, and I'm not going to throw Fran under the bus, but... Think about, think about the hypocrisy when you say, we can watch this, but you can't. And that gave birth to a desire in her to want to do it. That's how our carnal nature is wired. How do you think the devil came and started playing Eve's song? Because that's what she wanted because she'd been told she couldn't. Okay. They thought it foolish to acknowledge God. That's what happens when you feel the Holy Ghost tell you, don't need to do that. And you say, I'm going to get you in a minute. Let me just try it a little bit more. And eventually what happens is, the Lord convicts you because he doesn't condemn anybody. He convicts you and he says you shouldn't do that. You shouldn't watch that. You shouldn't listen to that. You shouldn't read that. You shouldn't be around that. And you just keep on doing it. And then you say, are y'all ready for this? I ain't even convicted of that, so it must be right. Huh? You see why people say that? Based upon this scripture? Huh? He lets them worship what they want to worship. That's why so many times people walk away from God and it looks like everything works out perfect for them. Because no longer is the Holy Ghost there pleading and pulling and begging and crying because that's what he does. Huh? Huh? He stood over Jerusalem and wept. Huh? Okay. Look here. Let me keep moving. I'm going to try to get done. 
So since they thought it foolish to acknowledge God, he just left them alone to their foolish thinking and let them do things that should never be done. It's in our world now. They're pushing things on us that don't even make sense. Human beings, hear me right now, and I'm not going to beat a dead horse, and I'm sure not enough, I, I don't want to camp out here for a while, but human beings are doing things animals won't do. Yes. That's right. And so that's the thing. But it's a conscious decision. Yes. It's, it's yes. Decision. Yes. It's a decision. And this is a, that, that's a beautiful concept that we also get a picture of right here because the Lord doesn't step in front of your TV. Right. Oh, man. But you turn it on there. And about five seconds in, they're dropping this and dropping that and showing this. And the Holy Ghost says, cut that off. That, that, that's what I'm talking about. Do you hear that? She said, you get that ooey feeling. That's what I'm talking about. I told us before, I preached to us before, and unfortunately, I feel like I'm an expert of it. Once you're filled with the baptism of the Holy Ghost, you can't sin in peace. Thank God. Thank God that somehow, some way, that I was able to fight through my own messed up thinking and my own messed up feelings and, and surrender to the voice of God before it was too late. Because you think, well, too late is when, no, too late is when you don't care anymore. Mm, 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 mm. Then he says this about him in verse 32, and I'm bringing it home. These same people who knowing the judgment of God, how do you know what's going to happen to people that persist in these behaviors? Because the Bible says so. But the fearful and the abominable and all adulterers and fornicators and all liars shall find their part in the lake of fire. Look here. Who knowing the judgment of God, that they which commit such things are worthy of death, not only do them, and here's where I'm fixing to teach to you for a minute, young people, I'm back on you again, and the rest of us, but I just want to try to cut y'all off at the pass. Not only do these things, but have pleasure in them that do these things. So, it's not enough to say, I don't do it. But you can't be watching movies that they do it in. The literal translation says you cannot approve of others that do these things. Say, well, I don't approve of it. If you buy tickets to their show, if you turn on their program, let me get, if you buy their music on one of them programs, if you rent their movies, am I doing all right? I mean, really, is it? Look here. If you watch them on TV and in movies, you buy tickets to their concerts, you purchase their music, you follow them on social media, you watch their videos, you listen to and or read their stories, you are approving of their life. Not only are you approving of it, you're contributing to it. Oh, Lord, help me, Jesus. In short... Failing to regulate or set boundaries in our entertainment and or in our influences results in death. 
And it's not the death you're thinking about, but it's a spiritual death. And I would argue that spiritual death beats natural death to pieces six days a week and twice on Sunday. It's more dangerous. It's more fearful. We should fear spiritual death more than anything. Because there's no room for godly influence among the influence of the world. And that is hell's strategy. To keep us inundated with the things of the world. Worshiping the creature more than the creator. Because if you'll recall from a series that I taught right before COVID. About 26 lessons. I didn't even finish. The walls or boundaries of a city serve three purposes. Boundary, identity, and protection. Protect yourself. Protect your kids. Protect your home. Holiness, Sister Maria, is safe. Death's holiness is peace. I was in this church right where Garrison and Paige are sitting right now. A backslider asked to meet with me and their son because he woke up at 2 o'clock in the morning. He was in high school, and he woke up at 2 o'clock in the morning being choked to death by a spiritual being. And they were terrified. They said, we need to talk to you, Brother GL. And I walked down this aisle. They were sitting back there. And the Holy Ghost, I didn't know what in the world was going on. And the Holy Ghost said, ask him what he's watching. And I sat down there. I didn't beat around the bush. I didn't try to be friends. I said, what are you watching? And he wouldn't look at me. And his mama looked at him. And smacked him on the back. And he told me what he'd been watching. And some of us are going to think it's innocent. But I'll tell you what it was. It's a show called Supernatural. I ain't never watched it because that was the first time I heard of it. And his mama started slapping him on. I told you not to watch that. I told you not to watch that. I told you not to watch that. The eye is the portal through which the enemy attacks us. Holiness is safe. And let me tell you, unless you think I'm mean and I'm rigid and I'm harsh and I just want to control everybody, that's nonsense. You ain't been sitting here and me preach and teach. If you knew the heat that I took from people that think I'm too lax and I'm too easy and I'm not hard enough, if you knew the attacks that people have double-barreled attacked me, letting down, letting people do things. But the reason why we have to preach this stuff is God's got a great big plan and it includes you. He's got big dreams and big plans. He said, I know the thoughts I have for you. Thoughts of good and not of evil for an assured end. And the devil doesn't want you there. And the devil doesn't want you there. How else can the enemy invade our lives? More powerful than by controlling what we find entertaining. I looked up the definition of entertaining. It scared me to death when I read it. Look here. Agreeable occupation for the mind. That's the dictionary definition of entertainment. Agreeable occupation for the mind. Listen, diversion. Distraction. Uh huh. Yep. And it was a whole lot different back then than it is now. Yep. But with that being said, I could come up with a long list of people you shouldn't watch, shows you shouldn't watch, and all of that stuff, and you might do it. 
but that don't make it holy. What makes it holy is when you shun it because you'd rather listen to the spirit than the flesh. And it feels ooey. That's the Holy Ghost. That's the Holy Ghost. Because I'm fearful that sometimes if we, if the Lord is with us and we sit down on the couch and some of the stuff, I think heaven covers his eyeballs up. Okay? Or gets up and leaves. But listen to me. All entertainment isn't wrong. In order for entertainment to be healthy, it must be edifying, holy, and godly. In short, make you better, not worse. Has anybody ever sat down and watched a movie for an hour and a half or two hours and got up and felt like you needed a bath? Not because it was bad, but because you just sat there and let life pass you by for nothing. It added nothing to your life. I'm bringing it home right now. Brother Bernard says, we have abundant evidence of the spiritual, mental, emotional, and physical effects of unwholesome entertainment. It feeds the lust of the flesh, is a constant source of temptation, is a thief of our time, it harms family life, it damages children's character and morals, it promotes sin, and is psychologically detrimental. The rate we're going right now The average person by the age of 65 will have spent nine of their 65 years sitting in front of the television. If you added it all together, nine years of your life by the age of 65 just sitting there. The call of this pastor tonight is until we regulate what comes into our lives, we have no hope of regulating what comes out of our lives, and that includes the work of the Lord. How many of us have things we want or need God to do in our lives and in the lives of those that we love? I know, I'm, I'm going to interject this, I know some people don't care for our offering declaration. And how does it talk about uh, my family being saved and all of that? Because the Bible says your heart's where your treasure is. That's why it can do it. Because if your treasure's in the right place, then your prayers are in the right place. And your heart's in the right place and your life is in order. That's how it works. I know pastors that will, before they hire any staff member, will ask to see their checkbook. Because your checkbook tells where your heart is. Okay, I ain't done it yet, but it's a good idea. How many of us are frustrated, stressed, critical, judgmental while living unfulfilled lives? Yet we continue to watch, listen, share, and in most cases pay for the privilege of having our lives inundated with unholy garbage. I would submit that this would be the place to start in pursuit of becoming the living sacrifice that we can present to God, which will result in a transformation by the renewing of our minds. And then we can prove what is that good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. I would argue that when our minds are convoluted with hell's trickery, we will call the will of the devil the will of God. Matter of fact, the Bible says it. Because they receive not a love for the truth, he will send them a strong delusion. You will believe a lie and be down. That scares me to death.
Stand with me. There's a reason why I didn't start listing things and shows and people and all of that. There's a reason. Because I would just be legislating holiness upon you, and that's impossible. But I, if, if nothing else, when you sit down in your easy chair and you pick up your remote or you step over to your computer and you hit your mouse, I hope the words of this preacher resonate in your mind. I'm going to say this real quickly because I feel like I need to. I think I'm going to get off Facebook. I don't get on it much anyway. And the only reason I stay on it is many people contact me through Facebook. But it ain't all the bad stuff that's on Facebook. It's how embarrassed I've been getting on Facebook. When people I pastor are recommending nasty movies to one another on Facebook, it embarrasses me. Filthy, nasty. You will not let somebody come and sit on your couch and talk like that. But you'll turn the TV on and let everybody who will just talk like that in your house. Don't make sense. Somebody's thinking right now, I wish he'd shut up. <laughs> I came with a word from heaven. I was going somewhere else, I promise you. Don't be angry. Don't be mad. Here's the word you need to hear. God's got big things for you. And the devil's trying to divert you from what God has for you by something that appeals to you and attracts you. And I can't let that happen. Lord, we love you tonight. We appreciate you. We thank you for your goodness, mercies, kindness, for your word for power. I thank you for these precious young people that stayed with us tonight. I pray that the words we've taught will reverberate in their minds and the people's minds that are here in the house. I pray, God, that we will begin to let the Holy Ghost regulate what we allow into our lives, into our minds, and in our hearts. We can't continue to propagate it. Sometimes it comes, we, we pray then, deliver us from evil. But more than anything, God, lead us not into temptation where we will fall prey to our own lust and our own desires and our own want to. And when lust is conceived, it brings forth sin. And when sin is finished, it brings forth death. I don't want to die, Lord. I want to live and not die. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you for coming tonight. See you all Sunday at 10.